Death might be inevitable, but it doesn't always need to be tragic. Hospice doctors can offer a unique insight into what it's like right before you die. For healthcare professionals who work in the field of palliative and hospice care, providing support for terminally ill patients can give a rare insight into questions many of us face when contemplating life and our own mortality. Now, in an exclusive interview with Health Digest, Dr. Simran Malhotra, a triple board certified physician in internal medicine, hospice and palliative care doctor, and lifestyle medicine coach, shares firsthand how her patients have influenced the way she leads her own life in hopes it will inspire others to do the same. Dr. Malhotra details why she became so passionate about this line of work. I remember one of my very first rotations um, during my internal medicine residency was in the ICU. Um, and I just felt so much for the patients and their families because I felt like they didn't get enough time and attention from the medical team. And so for me, when I did my first palliative care rotation, I got to sit down with a family. I got to understand, you know, what their goals were, what their hopes were, what their worries were. And it really allowed me to, you know, get in with them in their experience and try to provide the most you know, personalized and compassionate care possible. When it comes to regrets, Dr. Malhotra asks patients about what holds personal meaning in their lives. I have thousands of patients' stories um, from my experience. Um, but if, and if you ask someone else that does what I do, we could probably narrow it down to three common themes or three common um, regrets um, that most people have. One of the three common regrets most frequently voiced by patients was not spending more time with loved ones, including years lost due to a trivial disagreement. I've had so many patients share that specific regret of like, I wish I, you know, didn't lose 10 years of talking to my daughter or my son over, you know, whatever the issue was. Um, that's a very common one. Another common regret was working too much. She points out that in the U.S., success is so often linked to productivity that it drives us to dedicate much of our time to work. When you're working all the time, that means you're not, you're, you know, you're missing out on that time with your loved ones or your family um, and yourself. Lastly, she has found that patients' third most common regret was a lack of courage to pursue their passions and desires. We don't want to let people down, um, especially when it comes to like our parents. And there's a lot of cultural things that tie into this and everything. But um, that is probably one of the biggest ones. Like, I wish I had done X, Y, or Z. She goes on to explain that while her patients can have such unique personal stories, the regrets in the end wind up being much the same. In my several years of practice now, if my patients are able to talk to me, there's two things that I always ask them in my encounters. And that is what brings you joy and then what's most important to you. And from these questions, you know, they, you know, everyone shares their answers, but then eventually it leads to this conversation about the things they wish they had done. Dr. Malhotra says there is a lot we can learn from patients' lived experiences including taking better care of ourselves while we're alive. One thing she frequently hears patients talk about is the lack of care they had for themselves, which is becoming a more common problem in the modern era. People are getting sicker at a younger age. And so, you know, before when we used to think about end of life, we were thinking about, you know, our 70s and 80s and 90s, but now it's not uncommon um, for us to be seeing and caring for people much, you know, younger at the end of life. Although fear, anxiety, and sadness are among the most common emotions Dr. Malhotra sees patients experience before they pass, she says hope is the most predominant. Many communicate their fear of the unknown, concerns about their families, anxiety about potential pain they may experience, and sadness around leaving the world and their loved ones behind. But many others feel a sense of peace. I've kind of witnessed over and over again, there's this dance between what people hope for desperately and what they fear the most. So it's like this dance between life and death. Fear of the unknown may also be a very challenging emotion for most, particularly if they don't practice religion. When you get into uh, religious and spiritual beliefs, there are thoughts about what is coming. But for many people, if they're not religious, they don't know. And so there's a lot of uncertainty of um, dying and not knowing what's coming. Someone's age and life stage can also play a role in how much anxiety they experience. There's a lot of anxiety specifically for our younger 
patients who are who might have young families, young children. Um, there's a lot of anxiety around, you know, what's going to happen to my children if I'm gone, right? Who's going to raise my children? Being a palliative care doctor has given Dr. Malhotra a rare opportunity to see both courage and vulnerability in her patients and their families. All of these really difficult emotions that most of us, I think, have been taught by society to keep in, right? Mm -hmm. When we don't share them openly, but you know, near the last several hours to days to weeks to months of life, these are things that you see um, in the hospital setting um, or in the hospice setting. Most people share that they want to be home, they want to be without pain, and they want to be with the people that they love. They want that certainty. While our material possessions may be very important to us in the present, Dr. Malhotra shares that it's not often what patients feel most proud of at the end of their lives. However, items that hold personal significance might begin to take on new meaning as death approaches, such as written letters. Dr. Malhotra promotes the idea of legacy work, or finding ways to leave parts of ourselves behind for our loved ones, especially for younger patients. Write out birthday cards for their kids until the age of 10 or 15, or record videos, especially nowadays, you know, with iPhones and tablets, it's very easy to keep those things for a long time. Um, or share, you know, create ways to feel like they're one in control of being able to share the things that are most meaningful to them. And number two, that they won't be forgotten, you know, that they're leaving behind something um, if they don't have the time to live that life. Dr. Malhotra tells us patients often take the most pride in personal relationships, milestones, or accomplishments towards the end of their lives. It's always about their relationships um, or about, um, you know, how they're so proud of their children or their great-grandchildren or the things that they're doing with their life um, and, you know, their education and, you know, the things that they've accomplished. When taking stock of what we're most proud of, Dr. Malhotra suggests posing a series of guiding questions to ourselves, known as the rocking chair test. When I'm 90 years old and I'm sitting in that rocking chair, looking back on my life, you know, what would I have wanted to accomplish and, and what would I be most proud of? Dr. Malhotra states that the rocking chair test can help bring clarity when we're feeling conflicted in our day-to-day -day lives as to what ultimately matters most. As a patient nears death, Dr. Malhotra says that their final words often vary based on a sense of fulfillment. I found that my elderly patients will often share things like I'm at peace or I've lived a good life. Um, whereas for my younger patients, they never, at least from what I can remember, I haven't really had any patients that have shared openly um, any specific words, but they, it, it really comes down to like, I'm not ready to die, right? I have so much more living to do. Dr. Malhotra also suggests that while each person may wish to share what's uniquely individual to them, there are common expressions when the end is near. When we're talking about the last hours to days, I think one thing that I make certain to share with my patients and families um, is to share the very simple things, I think that matter most, right? Like, I love you, please forgive me, I forgive you, thank you, I'm sorry. Um, and oftentimes when I'm telling this to a patient or family, you can just see like tears streaming down, um, you know, because these are some of the most meaningful when said with intention words that we can share with someone that we love. It's not just the words of our dying loved ones that are important and meaningful. In fact, the words we say to those who are departing are just as important. Amid grief, it can be so challenging to find exactly the right words. Because oftentimes when you're at that point, sometimes you just don't know what to say. You are lost, loss of words, right? Um, and you just kind of, a lot of times people are thinking about, well, I wish this wasn't happening. Um, instead of thinking about the things that they do want to say, um, with their loved ones. Dr. Malhotra explains it's important to understand that just because a patient isn't alert doesn't mean they can't hear. She recommends... Share the things that you want them to know because hearing is often the last sense to go. The same holds true in reverse as well, she says. You wouldn't want to say anything you wouldn't want them to know or hear. As a palliative doctor, she's found deep connections and community, particularly when it comes to her own health risks. I've cared for a lot of women um, at the end of life, a lot of young women. Um, 
who have had the same genetic mutation as um, I do. I, I carry the BRCA1 genetic mutation. Um, for those that are not familiar with it, it's the Angelina Jolie mutation. Um, and it radically increases your lifetime risk of um, breast and ovarian cancer. In a head. Some of her patients share impactful words with her on their deathbeds. One patient told her, this doesn't have to be you, which changed the entire trajectory of her life. It empowered her to take the extra initiative to care for herself and get the answers she wasn't getting from her medical team. In addition to living a healthy life, Dr. Malhotra's patients have inspired her to live her life with intentionality. Since the pandemic, I've been doing so much inner work. I've been trying to figure out what's most important to me. I've really, really uh, started focusing on forgiveness um, and mending my relationships um, that were not where I wanted them to be. When it comes to living fully, she encourages individuals to share their stories and to find strength in a community of people that inspires and uplifts them. As I know that every day I wake up, it's a gift. And every day I wake up, I can create the life that I want to create. Um, and if you ever feel like you can't, just know that, you know, <laughs> the, this life that we're given, you know, every, every day you have the opportunity that someone else wishes they had right now.